All right, guys, we can go ahead and get started with our continuing on with our case study concerning matrices and sparse matrices. Looking back at where we left off in our last. Maybe we won't be able to look back. <laughs> no, we're having some technical difficulties. One moment, guys. My screen hasn't frozen, that's the good news. All right. All right, so looking back, and we decided to try a more sparse representation of our matrix so we can save some space here. And I know it's supplementary or something that we will then also save some time in doing uh, various operations on our data. And then here we notice that with all these zero entries, it seems to be unnecessary to store this information as addition multiplication of zero is trivial. And so we will condense this information into a sparse representation that represents each one of these entries as a free tuple, including the row, the column, the value. We also decide within our design scheme to order them, right? Order each of these terms, these entries in the matrix by their row scan order. Right? As we'll see, this will lead to a faster implementation with respect to some of our operations. I think we ended on an example very much like this: how to come up with an algorithm to add a matrix right, in this new representation. I think everyone was pretty familiar with how you could write an algorithm to add two matrices in their standard implementation if you just had a two the array. We have a sparse matrix representation, of course, we'll have to change the, the uh, innards of that algorithm to get the appropriate result. And, and so we left off here investigating right, this particular example, coming up with some pseudocodes to traverse these, these structures and compute the addition of the two sparse matrices. Right, a few observations we had was that our traversal here seemed unnecessarily long. That is, we did a Traversal of A, right? And during this traversal of A, we did a traversal of B, so we added embedded traversals. The result was in this particular looping structure, big theta of the num terms of A times the num terms of B, right? And then we repeated this inefficient traversal of the structures, right? The resulting time complexity was big theta of num terms A times num terms B. We also noted an issue with respect to allocating C. That is, we want to start adding terms as we're computing the sum to this C structure, to the new sparse matrix. Given our array implementation, parallel arrays are array of tuples, we'll need to, and given the constraints of our computing device, we'll need to allocate space for this array before we can start adding terms. Given this constraint, we ran into an issue with C. How much memory? And we, how much memory do we need to allocate for C? And can we determine how much memory we need to allocate for C? Right, we notice that right, C, the size of C, right, we decided the min value could actually be zero, right, if after some of the additions, right, we would zero out some terms, right, and so the minimum size of C, the resulting C uh, matrix, would be zero. That means we might have zero, non-zero terms. Right, and we determine the max length of C or the max size of C might be, like, the worst case scenario would be that there's no matching row column pairs in A or B. And so max would be right, num terms A right, plus num terms B. And so we have sort of this range of, of potential values for C. And I believe we left off, we were trying to see if we could narrow this down and try to determine number of terms in C before beginning the actual addition. Right. And this in fact is, is not something that is clear from the term or from, from these structures. 
right, to determine how much size we need to allocate for C, we need to determine how many matching pairs there are between A and B. Right? This information is not abundant without a traversal of the, uh, the structures A and B. Right? So, in fact, we would, in a sense, have to do the addition to determine how many spaces we need to allocate for C, and then do the addition again, so then we can then insert the terms in C. Right? So not only is this approach efficient in that we have embedded loop in, and a redundant loop here that's seemingly unnecessary, we have to perform this just to determine the size of C. And we can't insert our, our, uh, our items as we're going through our range. We then have to perform this again and actually start inserting the right? So this is uh, fairly inefficient. Right? And the, the inefficiency of this particular approach right, is number one. Right, our use of an array for, for the main structure here. And we need to allocate space. We don't necessarily know the space beforehand. Right, and number two, we're not taking advantage of the fact that these items are in sorted order. And this is the main reason why we're going to keep these items in a row scan order, so we can improve upon this sort of scheme. If they're not in any order, and we can't do all the better than this. And any questions about that? So let's see if we can do better. Let's try to do better. All right. So let's try to take advantage of the fact that the entries in A and B are in a row scan order. Given this, right, how can we traverse A and B right, so that we don't have to, for every row in A or every entry in A, search over B? Well, let's go ahead and bring up one of our examples here and try to step through it to see if we can come up with some intuition here. Right, so let's start at A, right, at the beginning of A and at the beginning of B, and let's look at this. Initially speaking, are these terms matching? Right. No, no, they're not matching. In fact, there's only three possible outcomes. Right. Whenever we are pointing at a term in A and a term in B, right, the case is that the terms could have the same location, and they could have the same row-column pair. Right. The term A could come before, in a row scan, or it could come after in a row scan. Right, those are the three options. Right, equal row scan, right, before in row scan, or after row scan. Three options. All right, so given this information here, starting here and here, what can we say about right, what can we say about our resulting sum? Right, let's look at this case by case. In this particular instance, this is A, right, and this is B. Right, this particular term in A is coming before this term in B, right, in a row scan. Right, they're both in row zero. This is column one, column five. And right, so this entry is earlier, right, in, uh, in the matrix. Again, assuming that they're the same size as we're performing the matrix addition. All right, so in our case here, right, the current term in A is earlier in the matrix than the current term in B. So what does this mean since we've started, we just started here in this particular iteration, right, in this particular state? Well, this means that this term, right, the zero, one term does not exist in, in B. Do you guys agree with that? Right? Otherwise, it would have been earlier. We would have encountered it initially. Right? So since there is no zero, one term in B, right, what, what does this tell us about our resulting sum C? Yeah. It's just zero, one. Right, you need to simply add this term, right, because the corresponding term in B is just a zero. Right, it's not here, so that means it was a zero entry. Right, so trivially, you can just insert this term into the resulting sum, right, because we'll be adding, let's pretend that's a five. We'll be adding five to zero, and we'll get five. So the resulting sum will just be zero, one, five. Right. Right, at this point, you've inspected this term and done the corresponding addition associated with it, so we can now increment this iterator. Go to the next term. So can you just say one more time what you meant about size? So like, although these don't have to be the same size, although A and B are the same size, right? Like 
these two arrays. Right. The, the number of rows and the number of columns that these sparse matrices represent have the same number okay. of rows and columns. Okay. The number of entries right, in the sparse matrix representation is not necessarily the same. We don't necessarily know the number of entries resulting in our C sparse matrix. Observation clarification. All right, so now again, we can update our traversal of A and use the same logic here. Now in a row column scan, we can compare this entry and this entry, and in a, I'm sorry, row, a row major scan. Right, so this entry is going to come before this entry in a row major scan. Right, we have zero, five, the zero is row, fifth column. This is the second row, first column. Right, in a row major scan, this entry is going to come first. Right, so what does that tell us right, with respect to right, this entry? It's the first one. Right? It means that we're not going to have a zero, five entry in this matrix. Otherwise, we would have encountered it first. Encountered it. Right? So what does that mean? Well, in our matrix A and zero, five, the value is zero. Right, so the resulting sum here is just simply going to be at the zero five spot. We're adding three and zero, so the result is just zero, five, three. Right. So if B becomes comes before A right, in the row makes in the row major scan. Right, this simply add the term B to C right, and update our iterator. All right. Similarly, we can continue this. When we get to an entry that is similar, as we have now done, right? we can see now that our, our iterator is pointing to this second term in A. Right? This term represents an entry at 2, 1. Right? This iterator for B represents a term at 2, 1 as well. So we have the matching case. And so if we have the same row maker scan index, and that means that they are co-located in the matrices that they represent. In matrix addition, this means that we want to add the values. Right, so they're both located at 2, 1. Right, so the resulting term here in C will simply be 2, 1, followed by the sum of these two values, 3 and 4, which will be 7. At this, case, at this time, we can now increment both as we've accounted for both terms. This incrementer now goes past the number of terms in that particular entity, right? and this one goes here. All right, so if one of our counters, or if one of our iterators, excuse me, goes past the number of terms contained in that entry, what does that tell us about the remaining terms in our, right, in the other entity? Right, so for this entry and all subsequent entries, right, we can just copy those terms over to A because we're doing the non-trivial zero additions for each of those terms. Right? And so all of any subsequent terms right, can just simply be copied over or inserted into our new structure. So here we can insert four, two, five. If we had any other terms here, we could just insert them over as well because there are clearly no matching terms in B. Right? We have a trivial zero addition. All right. So just looking at this particular traversal, Right. It's a lot faster right, than, our, than our other scheme. Right. Note here that we traversed A how many times in total? Just once. Right. We had our iterator started at the top, came to the bottom. Right. Note also here with B, the same. It right. started at the top, went to the bottom. Right. So <clears throat> given this, and what is our overall time complexity? And if we were to look at slightly more detailed code, uh, pseudocode of this, and you can see that it's going to traverse the number of terms in A. It's going to take the number of times and each traversal step is just a constant number of operations. And traversing B, it also is going to take the number of terms in B times. And so, and the, total, and the total time complexity is going to be big theta. So there's theta, big theta of num terms A plus num terms B. Yeah. This approach, even though it's more efficient, doesn't um, Fix the problem that you have to allocate the array before. Right. Yeah, a very good observation. Again, although we have significantly reduced our time complexity here from num terms times num terms to num terms plus num terms, right? We still have the issue of well, how big is C going to be? How much space do we need to allocate for our sparse matrix representation of the result of some? Right? And again, since we have decided to implement this as an array. 
if we want to have the size to be efficient, if we want to allocate exactly the right amount, right, we will need to know that information. And in order to know that information, in this instance, we actually have to perform the sum first to see how many matching terms and non matching terms. Very good observation. Uh, Ivan? Yeah. Again? Um, another question? Yeah. In, I know it's probably like apples and oranges, but in terms of whether or not you would want to iterate through twice to return the correct size or allocate an array that's too large, which one would be more desirable? All right, so let's say that we have. Uh, right, so let's say that we have uh, A and B. We want to add C. Right, we decided that C, or the size of C, is going to be upper bounded by what, the number of terms in A plus the number of terms in B. <laughs> Right, so our space allocation for the sum, so our space complexity for the sum is going to be, let's analyze our space requirements. Well, we need to store A and B right, in memory. Those are going to be somewhere in memory. And so we're going to have num A locations. And we're going to have num B locations. And then to store C in memory, we're going to need right, about num a plus b plus num b basic. Okay. Then we'll need a few other spaces for some iterator variables and things of that sort, some constant number of spaces. So, right. so uh, here's our time space trade off. So here we have the, the time complexity for this. And we determined was uh, we're going to traverse A once and B once. Right, so computational steps. Right, so it's going to be right, about uh, proportional to right, num terms A. Right, let's just keep it as num terms A plus num terms B. Right, we can do that. All right, and this is for the case where we, let's say, just allocate it without doing the sum first. So we'll allocate twice as much space as we need. All right, so allocate over, we'll call this the over allocating case. Right, does everyone understand the question here, the trade off? We have, uh, we're faced with uh, our decision here, the, the con of using a uh, matrix in this particular instance is that we need to know the size of the matrix to represent the result in sum. Right? However, in order to know the size, we need to perform the sum first. So we'll have to potentially do it twice. Right? And here, our other case will be perform the sum first. Yeah. Um, so the, the way you so you're noting, for example, in C if you want to allocate an array on the stack. Right, it needs to be a constant size. It needs to be determined at compile time rather than runtime. Right, so this is a good observation. Right, so if you are using a version of C that requires that to array, it's constant at compile time then. Right. Right, it's not necessarily going to be known at compile time all the possible additions you're going to be doing in, in your main method. Right? But you don't necessarily know the right and it's going to change for different A's and B's. Right, so it'll change during runtime. So in order to allocate this correctly, we'll have to put it on the heap because you don't know the size of the I can help. Great question. Um, for the first piece, is there a way to match the person that they see how large the array is in C++? 
groups. All right, so another good question here. How do you know the size of A and B right, to, to allocate C? Right, it would be a good idea, very likely, to, to keep that variable, to keep that as a number variable for your sparse matrix, uh, sparse matrix structure. You can just keep track of the number of times in which. And in fact, if you're going to do it this way, you, you would need to do that. Okay. Good observations. This works, uh, even. Yeah. All right, so over <laughs> Okay, so if we just perform the sum first, right, then the space requirements are going to be reduced. And right, we're going to have num A, right, num B, right, and then we'll just call this num C. Let's see, as we know, can vary depending on the case. All right, and here we have computational steps, though. Computational steps. All right, are going to be approximately half of this. Right, as we're not going to, oh, we're going to double this, right, because we're going to do the sum first. So we're going to do, so it's going to be about 2C. It's num A. Sorry, my wrist has gotten a little disordered here. It's num B. Does that make sense? And we're going to have to do essentially these same operations twice to determine the size of C. And we're going to have 2C, num A plus num B. All right, so if we're just looking at the, the time complexity here, this seems like a really good option. If we're looking at the space complexity here, well, the space complexity might, in the worst case, actually be the same. And so, in the worst case, we're going to get the same, we're get the same issue here, or the, the actual the same space complexity, but half the number of computational steps. Generally speaking, if you have a trade-off between time and space, right, depending on your applications, right, you may err on the side of reducing your time complexity right, if there's a trade-off of this nature. Again, here in the worst case, the space complexity is going to be about the same. Right. For your projects, whenever you're faced with a, a trade off like this, right, and it's a fairly even trade off, right, I encourage you to err on the side of improving your time complexity or generally reducing your space complexity. There is one concern about implementation here is right, if you keep doubling the size, right, or you keep increasing the size of a resulting sum unnecessarily. That extra unused memory might grow and grow and grow if you don't carefully manage that. Right? It'd be easy to manage that by just keeping track of the number of actual terms in C, right? in regard to the <coughs> actual size of C, the size of the matrix joint. You don't want to, like you have subsequent sums A plus B plus C plus B plus Z, you don't want to just keep doing the worst case and adding the size of the array, but actually adding the number of terms that, that the array is running. Because they may be more, the size of the array is going to be larger than the number of terms. And if you are adding the size of the array, you're going to propagate that extra unused space to your resulting uh, matrices, to your resulting sums, and it'll grow up very well. And if you can't bound it, then the then straight off may not be important. Does that make sense? All right, so for example, any questions about the, the trade-off here? Right, this, is good, this is a good investigation because very likely you're going to be faced with design decisions like this for following the project. My question more has to do with um, the big trap of like some It would be an attribute of each sparse matrix representation. So, for example, in A, you had a sparse matrix A. Let's go over here. Nice. And sparse matrix A was created, let's say, of the result of some number of additions. And after this, some number of additions, we have three terms 
but let's say the size of the array is actually you know, six. Right? And when you go to add a to something else, right, it may or may not be important to know the size of the array is six, but you certainly will want to know the number of terms in here, which is three. Right? And so you'll want to keep that information with your structure A, so you can access it anytime you're accessing it. And so that would be, you would likely implement it as a member of A if you're implementing it as a structure or a class. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And again, here, this extra, right, this extra three spaces that aren't being used, right, whenever you perform an addition and you want to estimate the upper bound, the size of num C, right, when you do this sum to estimate the worst case the upper bound, you don't want to use this value, right, because then this, this extra new space is going to be propagated unnecessarily to the result in some really use this function. That was, I think, what I was trying to get across. And what would be like the best way to keep track of that number? Yeah, just keep it as a number. You should uh, keep track of the number of terms in A, keep track of the number of terms in B. When you create a new entity, update <coughs> and keep track of the number of terms in that new entity. Very good uh, observation is on. All right. So those are good questions and observations. Any any other questions? I'm going to, have to start bringing my own eraser now too. All right, so now that we've increased, improved our uh, time complexity here, let's look at a few more operations. It seems pretty intuitive that we're not going to be able to do much better than this. In order to add these terms, we're going to have to traverse each of them at least once. We're going to have to expect them and inspect them at least once to be able to perform the value. Right? Just intuitively, if you have two numbers and you want to add them, you need to inspect those two numbers to get the, the sum result. You can't not inspect them. You can expect to know the sum. Resulting sum. <clears throat> All right. So the pseudocode, a little bit more detailed than this. Right. I'd like to say pseudocode. It's C-like pseudocode. There's a few uh, oddities in here. If you're having trouble understanding what I what I meant by these brackets here, you know, I, I do apologize. How many of you have friends that maybe live in the EU and speak a few different languages? Do they sometimes just bounce back and forth between languages when they're speaking? It, it is like Euro slang, I think call it, right? And I have a few friends like this. And, you know, after learning a few languages, sometimes you know, I'll just start in one language and sort of transition to that one. That would be a matter of like pseudocode. And so this, this will happen. You know, whenever I think of matrices, I go into MATLAB or Python code and start doing some kind of things. And I do apologize uh, for this confusing. But the idea here is just simply that. Right. If we're representing this as a, a parallel array or array of doubles, right here I just was representing uh, each term as a 2 to array. Right. So for example, if A was right here, 1, 3, 2, 1, 5. Right. I was just indexing in the error. This would be the row and this would be the column of that particular term. Right. So the 0th row right, would be the first entry right, and the 0th uh, entry in there. This would be the, the row for that entry. So this is the ith entry, for example, the row of the ith entry here. The row. Call. Right, and back. Does that make sense? And if you were doing like, a 2D array in uh, C++, right, you would do, you would use this right, instead of uh, this. Sorry. That was confusing. All right, but let's go ahead and trace over the pseudocode if you have questions about it. All right, so again, here we want to make this sum C equals A plus B. All right, so we'll initialize our iterator so we traverse A uh, and B structures. All right. All right, the first thing we do is determine the row major order of each of these All right, for the traversal. All right, so here we have uh, row major in the scene. 
right? And so for each of the terms in A, we'll determine the row major traversal. Right? And the, the B rate, the home major traversal. <laughs> Again, it's just determining the index of where each of these entities lie right? in their uh, the matrices that they represent. Right? So if the A term comes before the B term in the row major traversal, then we and in this particular case, what did we do? Well, this means that the A term isn't in B, so then we can just copy the A term over. And so that's what I've done here in these three lines. Just copy the, right, the value over, the column over, and the row over. Then I update right, the iterator up right, and update our term index, which is what we're indexing in to see. And copy term A over. And see what the for copy term A. Makes sense. Right? It's the three the three three terms we're copying A. We're going to copy the row value, the column value, and the, the val value. Right? Else if if A, the A entry comes after B, then what do we want to do? We want to copy the B term over. And so we just copy right, each of the three entities over to the C term. Again, update our, our iterator, and here we have a counter for the C. All right, else, if they're equal, what do we want to do? And we just want to add the like terms, copy over the row value, column value, and then the val value should be the sum of the A value and the B value for that term. So we just copy the row. <coughs> when we finish this traversal, right, so note here that we're doing this while we're still traversing through both matrices. If we finish this the traversal for one of the entities, that is, if we get to the end of A or the end of B, Right, we can we'll break out of this and just simply finish inserting the rest of the terms of the entity that we haven't finished traversing because those aren't going to have any matching terms to the corresponding entity, so we can just insert them into the sum. And that's what these terms are here. Do you mind explaining um, term in and then make the number after that? Yeah, so this is just the uh, the number of the index into the two D right? So it's the number the number term that we're on. Oh, okay. And the, the following number is just zero, one, or two to indicate the row, column, or value for that match. Sorry. And any questions about that? Again, it's sort of explaining at a slightly lower level. Again, we have the concern about well, if this is going to be an array. How are we going to decide? How are we going to allocate it? These are important questions. Do you say the row matrix index thing is only because it's just summary? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Check out the indices here. Right, so in, right, in the actual computer, if we have a 2D structure, we have to store it in memory, which is a linear structure, a linear structure. Right, if we have a 2D array right, with some number of rows here, right, let's say row 1, row 2, row 3. And rows and columns. All right, this is going to be inserted in a row major program, and right? it's going to be inserted in rows uh, on a row wide space. So row one will go in memory, right? and then row two, and then row three. And this is called a row major. Right. So if we have right, a particular index in here, let's say zero, one, two, Let's look at the actual matrix and not the sparse matrix representation. Right, so this is an actual matrix now, not the sparse matrix. Sparse first. Right, what is this going to look like in memory? Well, it's going to look like this 0, 0, 1, 5. If we have a row major scheme, MATLAB, or I'm sorry, C is row major, type on, column major. You know, programming language, we need to see it. Two, one, three, four, three, five, six, seven. Right. So, doing a row major scan, which is simply starting at the the first and beginning and scanning across this row major and coding into memory. If you want to get to, if you want to know the row major scan or where three right lies in memory as an offset to the beginning of your array, right, you can take the row value right, and the column value. And compute it arithmet arithmetically. That is, if we know the, let's say the row is odd, right, 
and the column is J, it would be I times num columns plus J. Right. And so, for example, if this is zero row, first row, second row, and we can do I, this would be one times num columns, which is four, <coughs> plus J, which is two. Right. And this will give us six, which would be. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm sorry. At the base of the array comes to the first element, so one, two, three, four, five, six. That's it's an option. All right. So we did it, right? You went from num to terms, time num terms to num terms plus num terms, right? It's a huge reduction in time pricing. Right? So this is sort of good things. Right? We'll take a two minute, three minute break and then we'll come back and we'll do a transpose. So we just an example with our sparse matrix side of the form addition with our, with our new structure. Let's look at doing a transpose with our new structure. <laughs> yeah, that question. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it in the while it's up And so this, uh, the remainder loop here is what we're going to be performing while we're still traversing both entities. We get to the end of one of the entities. Yeah. What we want to do is just simply insert all of the remaining entities. Right. And so what we, we logically decided to break out of this loop and then just break any you know, if i is still less than the number of terms today, that means we're still traversing it. Then we can check it left. Or if it was b that we hadn't finished traversing, then we'll finish traversing b. Well, it's not going to. What's it both? What's it both? Then we won't perform this. Like, if we hit the end at the same time, right, then we won't enter this loop. Or this loop. Right, we're not resetting the iterator here, we're just continuing on with the traversing it. We could uh, add some extra logic in here and here yeah, instead of doing this. The runtime will be the same, it's just the code's a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't a very sparse matrix. You wouldn't want to turn this into a sparse matrix. Increase your computation time. Right, so the idea is when converting matrix to the sparse matrix, you want to represent each term as a three couple. Mm -hmm. But we're going to skip all the zero terms. And so the idea is we don't have to count for the zeros. Right, so we can skip this term. This is row, zero, column, zero. Row, zero, column. This is a non-zero one, so this would be row zero, column two, row zero, two, and then the value for that is one. And if this were represented in the it would be that you want to turn the number in the case of the Say that? If this were represented in the polynomial, the number in the matrix is the correlation and the Base is the um, There are similar, there are parallels between them. I don't know that it's exactly a one to one mapping. We can, after we get through our examples, we'll talk about the polynomial project and we can identify the similarities. There's some idea of sparseness with the polynomials. There's some idea of keeping track of values of coefficients um, and or exponents depending on how you look at the yeah, there's certainly a lot of similarities. Did I miss anyone before, before we continue? Were there any other events? Do you have another question? Okay. So why are you then, if you're just getting like the put and put number of your are you getting like the actual value? Just for example, let's say you use the formula. Let's say you're on 
here, you want to get you know, the, 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 the first row in this case. It's very important. Right, so this is the actual, this is the actual matrix representation, not the sparse matrix representation. So here we're assuming that the sparse matrix representation. Oh, so right, because you're getting what row row. Uh -huh. Now we've decided to represent our sparse matrix with something that looks very much like a matrix. All right, guys, let's go ahead and, and move along. Let me check out a few more design decisions and algorithms related to this structure. And so we've gone over addition, and we've come up with a pretty good algorithm. Linear with respect to the size of the input, that's always, that's always desirable, especially compared to quadratic. So let's look at, at transpose. Seemingly, the idea of doing a transpose given our representation is pretty, right, is pretty intuitive, right? We have our row, right? we have our column and our values. Right? So why not just switch the row and the column? It seems like an easy way to to do the transpose of this particular matrix, the number variable we have to subsume for keeping track of the number of rows and the number of columns we'd have to close those two. But the problem with just doing that is given our ordering constraint and for our sparse matrix, which allowed us to do addition really quickly. Right? If we just do a simple blind swap here of the row and columns, right? we're no longer in a, a row major scan, right? they're not in a row major order. That is, right, this entry, which is in row 5, column 2, actually comes after this entry, which is row 2, column 3. And so our addition algorithm will no longer work. Our really fast addition algorithm is no longer going to work because we relied on the fact that they were in order. So if we do that linear scan, we're going to skip some terms and end our logic so it's not going to be correct. Right, so, so this is bad because the state of our, our structure is not maintained. So this is not a good example of doing a transpose in this particular, given this representation. Do we want to just simply then relax right, this particular constraint? Well, that, that constraint allowed us to go from essentially quadratic time to linear time in our addition algorithm. That's a pretty big boost. So we have to have some a pretty uh, pretty big downside with respect to our transpose to decide to lessen that constraint and just simply go with the quadratic implementation of the equation. Can we just swap them and do like a sorting order? Yeah, so you could do that. So if we did a swap, so let's say we did a swap. Let's look at this, you can do this. So I'll go like here. And so instead of a swap, and for each entry, I go for each term, I'll follow term. Right, swap row and call those. All right, and then after that, so this would be maybe step one. Step two would then be what? To sort the terms based on their their new row major scan. All right. All right. So it seems reasonable. What sort of time complexity are we going to get with this piece of sort of thing? Well, let's look at each of these steps. So if we go for each term and we swap the row and calls, about how many steps are we gonna have there? Yeah. Yeah, the number of terms in it. All right, so I'll just put a C in front, right? Some constant number, assuming that the swap takes a constant number for C and three more. What's that? And then sorting the the number of entries in A, let's say. 
uh, based on their road skin. How fast can you do this sort? Generally speaking, a very general case. Maybe uh, num term day, log num term day. Do you like quick sort or merge sort? So you guys have been exposed to sorting algorithms, I'm pretty sure. Have you guys been exposed to, you've been exposed to bubble sort, insertion sort? How about merge sort? Quick sort? What we're going to do, let's get some needs later when we do sorting. So we can do a sort in a little bit faster. Bubble sort, insertion sort, or quadratic. going to be the P and squared kind of complexity. And again, we'll investigate this when we look at sorting algorithms. Here we'll note that we can do this particular sort and to say num terms times log of num terms. Okay. Right. Again, a constant times this. And so the big thing of this altogether will be and C right, this num terms A plus C num terms A. We have two terms here. This term dominates this term, so we can leave it out of the upper bounding scheme, and then it's just C. This big data of num terms A log num terms A. So we'll just take it. Um, we'll just say that we're using a sorting algorithm that we know to be num terms log num terms. Right. It's not so bad. Num terms, log, num terms. Right. Log is uh, the inverse of the exponential function. And log is the logarithmic we'll assume in space two. So even if num terms of A is very large, right, this term is going to be fairly small. Right. So it's not as fast as linear, but it's not as slow as quadratic. Right. So it's not bad. It's not a bad approach. Does that make sense to everyone the approach? Right. We want to keep it in a valid order. Right, so you can't just simply do a, a blind swap of each of these values because our terms will no longer be in order of row scan or row meter scan. Uh, but we can fix that by just performing the subsequent uh, subsequent sort. Right, so here, right, we've essentially done this. This is the approach that, that I've taken here as well. Again, given our uh, given our sparse matrix representation. I want to determine the, the scan. I'd rather than doing the swap and then the sort here, I determine the collimator scan and then sort based on the, the resulting collimator scan, right, which is not a collimator scan, but the row meter of the transpose, right? And then do the hop. Right, so essentially the same as this. All right, again, our time complexity is going to be the same here because we're going to do this copy, which is going to be of the order of the known terms, right? And then we do a sort here. Is on the order of num terms log num terms. We choose a good sort of algorithm. You guys, Mary Joy, your email. Um, and even so, you're going to have to step it up. Get into the game here. Any questions about transpose? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Well, how does it differ from what we just did? Uh, it's not very different. Yeah. Okay. In this one, you determine the, the order first, and then do the copy here, and do the copy, and then the order. Okay. Is it the same? The time complexity. Uh, the big theta is going to be the same. Okay. All right, again, I encourage you to try one of these at home. Feel free to try multiplication or, or any other matrix operation you wish. All right, so let's go ahead and look back at our array implementation and compare our design decisions and the resulting implications of time complexity as for our operations. The use of the sparse matrix implemented as an array improved efficiency when compared to a standard matrix right, in an overall sense. That is, if we had uh, in our standard matrix and we wanted to perform addition, and in order to do that, we had num codes, num calls to times num rows operations, right? Our proportional to you know, that many number of operations, right? Whereas in our addition of our sparse matrix, we had number of terms, right? Big, big O of number of terms. 
So if our matrix is sparse, right, this is going to be much less than this number of operations. Right, if the number of turns is equal to right, the number of calls times number of rows, I mean that our matrix is full. It's not very sparse at all. All there's not a lot of zero entries. Right, then this this addition is going to be approximately like on the same order. But we'll get a gain here, right? If we have a lot of zeros, or we won't get that gain here. We have a standard maker. Right, for transpose, and we have big data of num calls, num rows. If we were to take the transpose of our original matrix, the full matrix, and right, it's going to take us the num calls from num rows to get there. Right, our transpose of our sparse matrix here is num terms log num terms. Right, if num terms is like our matrix is not sparse, if num terms is num calls times num rows, if we have that many terms, right, then our transpose for the sparse matrix might actually take a little bit longer here. Right, but if we do have a sparse matrix and num terms is much less than the number of calls times number of rows, then our transpose will still have a, a good state. Right, so this is the game here. Right, so if the matrix is not sparse, if it's not really sparse, right, the, the gains might be minimal or you might not have gains in some Stated observation. This is why the sparse matrix representation is you get improvements if the matrix is sparse. If, you have, if your matrix is full, in fact, then you're not really going to be gaining full representation. And in fact, you're going to be, and the intuition behind that is for each entry in the matrix that's non zero, you need to keep track of three values a row, column, and value. If you just have a regular matrix, you just keep track of the value. It's one of those. The row and column is just its location and memory, it's already being tracked. <clears throat> All right, so this array implementation was fairly intuitive as we had a list structure. We needed to keep track of a list of tuples, like a list of three tuples. And, uh, but we ran into some memory allocation constraints, of course, which happens whenever you use arrays. So if you, if you were going to create an object of which a few size you cannot know at the time of when you need to start using that object or, or keying items to that object. Right, so an array may or may not be a good idea. Right, we looked at the different trade-offs right, with uh, arrays and how you can overestimate, underestimate. We'll also talk about dynamic arrays uh, next week and discuss the pro and cons of using dynamic arrays as well. All right. And so as a result, if we wanted to allocate size appropriately, we had to do the addition twice, which is not, uh, which is not necessarily desirable. Right. If the size of the resulting uh, matrix uh, is known, uh, this was also a problem in, uh, with uh, transpose. Right? Uh, however, the, the allocation problem right, is not there because in the transpose, right, it's still just going to be known terms. So if you have A with known terms, then the transpose of A is also going to be known terms. So in that issue, right, in that uh, operation, we did not have the memory allocation concern. <laughs> All right, so we investigated the, the implementation our, uh, of our sparse matrix using our arrays. We made a design decision. We stepped through the pseudocode for each of the operations we wanted to perform on that data structure right, and determined whether it was an improvement or not. Right? And if it's an improvement, then it was a good design decision. If it wasn't an improvement, then it was a bad design decision. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at maybe another design decision. It's good to have more than one option. Right? So we looked at arrays, storing it continuously in memory, storing uh, tuples continuously in memory. So let's look at chaining, using a chaining approach. Right. Intuitively, we might think that this will alleviate some of our memory allocation concerns. Right. So again, we can represent, it's intuitive to represent a sparse matrix using these this three couple as that information needs to be stored for row, column, and value for each of the entries in the original matrix. And here we can note that it is a very similar design as our counterpart, but instead of right, instead of storing these tuples continuously in memory, we can chain them out. Right, why would we do this? Well, if we chain them out, we don't have to require that they're contiguous in memory. We can change the size of, of our list structure right, uh, dynamically, which should alleviate our allocation concerns. All right, so let's look at uh, a linked list implementation here. And again, we have some uh, pseudocode. Right, so let's look at what we have here. This is addition. 
And so, again, note that this is going to be similar to our array structure here. A slightly different notation that we gave that we're using a linked list rather than uh, rather than an array of tuples or, or a 2D array to store these sparse matrix data. Uh, we still have a similar looping scheme, and we have to iterate each entity at least once to do the sum. Right? But the, the big thing here is that we don't have to do the sum twice if we want to allocate the same appropriate number of locations for the resulting sum C. Right? We do this at a cost of one extra pointer per term. And again, for our, if we're going to chain this out, right, so we're going to need an extra pointer to point to the next link in the chain. Whereas in an array, you don't need that extra pointer because it's going to be using every chapter for the next term. Basically. Again, standard trade off with using one, a chain approach versus an array approach. Using this approach. All right, so here, what's the time complexity? Again, we're traversing over A and we're traversing over B. It's going to be big data of some terms of A plus some terms of Is there any difference in the time complexity? Because when you're having when you add to a list, unless you have a good job winner, you're traversing the list as well. Is that right? Right, right. So you're just you're moving that if you want to add to the end of the list, right, that you will really want to keep track of that itself. So, you want to have a tail backwards. Because otherwise you would get yeah. the end. Yeah, you certainly want to keep track of Yes. Good notes. Yes. If you have a link list, can you just add like the terms that you need to and to the existing so you don't have to make Yeah, so if you were a good a good observation. Again with our transpose operation, we sort of ran into this problem. Do we want to do this in place? If memory is a huge commodity, let's say we're implementing this on a, a very small uh, embedded system right, where there's not a lot of memory, memory is really sparse. Right? If in that scenario it's okay to destroy one of the inputs of this uh, this operation, right? we're doing A plus B, and we're never going to use A again, right? then, then corrupting the value of A might not be a bad idea. You could then start overriding the entries in A. If we're doing a sum, A might not be large enough, so we might still need to add some terms on to that link list, but we can certainly conserve memory. And, uh, in many instances, it's probably not going to be a good idea to corrupt uh, a calling object, but again, maybe an extreme situation where memory is more acute commodity, right, you, uh, you may consider uh, an approach like that. Uh, All right, so let's take a look at the transpose for the linked list. Uh, we have the, the same concern here. We can't just traverse the terms. Right. The algorithm, again, is going to look fairly similar for these. And we're going to have to, and we can't just simply go through the terms and swap the row and the column because we won't have a valid state. So what are we going to have to do? Right. We're going to have to do, or one way to alleviate this is to do the swap from the sort. Right. Or we can do the, the sort. As well. and again, we're going to have uh, just some chunk of code that's going to be big theta of the size of A, big theta in terms of A, right? And then the sort is going to take, we'll assume, big theta of non terms of A log non terms of A. Yeah. So it seems to be pretty identical between the like list and the right structure. Yeah, the, the time complexity, oh, let's, so let's compare them side by side. We have the discussion. Okay. All right, so we've prepared the linked list implementation. Right, so what are some implications? Right, so this, let's look at uh, the context of addition. Right, transpose. Right, and then maybe the actual structure itself, which may have some memory allocation. Okay. All right, so for addition, what were some of the pros of the linked list? What were some of the pros of using the array? Yeah. To avoid allocation issues. All right. 
right? So to right to efficiently allocate memory, and so for efficient memory allocation, right? We do not need to necessarily perform addition twice. So reallocation is efficient. Right. And the traversal is efficient. So both are efficient to find relatively efficient control. Right. So the array we had a trade-off, right? We can make the time efficient if we made the memory allocation inefficient. That if we just overestimated the memory, right? We could still make the time efficient. So we need two different options, right? We can make the time efficient. Make the time efficient. Right, this, uh, in order to do this, we had to overestimate the memory. The memory may not be efficient in this case. Right. Or we could have a time complexity that was on the same big data, on the same order. As it was in that case, but it was twice as long, so we could make the time right, twice as uh, twice the steps, the double the runtime in a sense, right, and we could get efficient memory allocation. Uh, transpose they were fairly equivalent. We didn't have the for the allocation concern with the array and because if we're taking the transpose of a sparse matrix that has in entries, the transpose will also have in terms. So the the memory and the the time complexity for each of these are relatively the same. So here, maybe you could say it's a better push. And you can dig a little bit deeper and look at the actual implementation and see if you can shave off a few steps here or there. Right? But on the order, proportionally, it's going to be about the same. And with respect to the structure itself, and well, we had this trade off here with the arrays. For the length list, we need to keep. And one extra pointer per term. And in order to maintain our, our list of merchants. And if we have any terms, then this is in extra locations. Wait, I can't. <laughs> so when you say uh, keep one entry pointer per term, how do you, why do you need that one? Uh, for each entry, for each couple in the uh, link list, and for each node in a link list, you have the value that it's storing, and then it points it to the next Oh, okay, that's right. So uh, it's fairly minimal as it's constant, and the memory requirements for a pointer is fairly, it's fairly small. And but you're going to need in and out. I don't have a many number, so yeah. So it's a minor quantity for the list. And the rest of the question is, can you scope between time twice the steps in your array? So that we said it was on the same order. It is on the same order, but it's, it's also twice the number of steps. If we wanted to allocate right, the resulting sum, right, we don't necessarily know how many terms there are. We can't grow that structure dynamically. And so we will need to do the sum to determine how many terms we have this as a counter without actually keeping track of the result the result of sum. And then you'll have to do the sum again. Right, to then once you can allocate and then add terms. So it'll be about plus. And the reason it's on the same order is because it's using comments It's on the same order, but it's twice. Yeah. Okay. If we were to choose to an array, then you would have to decide whether to use a sparse or a regular matrix. 
Yeah, so that's that's another design decision. So here we're just assuming that we're designing a sparse matrix right, construct. <coughs> determining or deciding when you want to use a regular matrix or, or a sparse matrix construct. Right? It would be be up to a designer. And one way to determine when that is the case right, is to look at the time complexity. So looking at this time complexity, look at these time complexities. Right, when would it be efficient to use a sparse matrix instead of a regular matrix? Or when would it actually be beneficial to use the regular matrix when it comes to uh, asking for the sparse matrix? And so we know the known terms is equal to known calls times number of this. These are about the same. Thing. Right, but known terms, if known terms is equal to known calls times number of this, then then this term is actually really larger than this one. And then maybe it's not going to be a good idea to use this cross matrix representation. So you can solve for known terms in terms of calls and rows, right? So determining when that trade off is <coughs> be the same, at least proportionally the same. And then that would be a reasonable decision of when to use the sparse matrix versus the regular matrix construct, given our design decisions. For the, if you do the, uh, the linked list, then you're linking all the <coughs> You have to create a class like a couple class, and then link together with data type and use it to a whole lot of data. Yeah, it seems that would be a reasonable way to design it, some sort of class or construct. It seems like when you're, this is kind of like, but when you're transposing, you have a sparse matrix and you have a sparse matrix, the data is right next to each other. Um, like, like you're at least um, but when you're using like a regular like array structure, they could be far or like we're using a normal matrix structure, they could be kind of far apart because they're separate places. Right. So that is a very, a very good observation. So this is goes, I think you're pointing out the practical implementation of the computer and worrying about cache delays. Right, right, right. Yeah. right now. So if you have a sparse matrix representation. <coughs> This will be stored. Uh, doing the transpose, you can do each term at a time. So if you load the terms in a reasonable way, right, you can do the transpose really quickly, right? meaning you're not going to get very many cache delays. Right? However, if you had a standard matrix, and it was a really big structure like this, <coughs> you want to do the transpose, you need to access IJ right, and, and JI. Right? That is, you're going to have to read the IJ entry of matrix or transpose, and then you need to write it to the ji location of the new matrix you're creating. Right? And so if both matrices are stored in their cache in a row major fashion, right, you're very likely to get some, some thrashing, right? because you're not going to be able to do a row major scan of both of them, right? because, because you're indexing the row and column of one of the matrices and the column and row of the other. So if you do 4i, 4j, it's going to be a row matrix scan for one of them, but it's going to be inherent in terms of a column matrix scan for the other. And so you're, you're very likely, if you have a huge matrix, you're very likely to get some thrashing. So yet another benefit to implementing uh, the sparse matrix, even if the number of terms might be similar to the number of first times. The observation, you know? All right. Let's go ahead and relate this to the project uh, real quick here. And so, uh, as you may have noticed, there's a lot of similarities between between some of the design decisions you've encountered here when designing a sparse matrix, and some design decisions you're going to encounter when designing a polynomial. So let's take a look at the polynomial in general. <coughs> and so a polynomial is a, a sequence of terms right, where we have some coefficient, say n, times a variable to the n power. It's a sum of a bunch of these terms into them. We use a polynomial expansion. Notation, right? Uh, organization will write it up as a sum of terms, and so then here we'll have the n minus first coefficient times x, the n minus one, 
and you have that all the way down to point C to be zero and that's context to be zero. So you can write this out in a more condensed fashion. Right. Zero coefficient divide times X. Yeah. All right, so as we identified in our matrix, we had we have number of rows and number of columns. We have number of rows times number of columns. Pieces of information or data we need to keep track of. However, we know that if we have zero in an entry, we don't necessarily need to keep track of it as it's not necessarily an important for the application. Right. So the, the zero entry, we were able to meet off to make our structure a little bit more efficient. All right, so in our polynomial here, what are some, what's the essential data we need to keep track of? And in order to characterize our polynomial, what sort of information? Oh. Oh, so C and I. What's that? C and I. C Sorry, and I, and so the coefficients? Right, the coefficient and the x one. Okay. X minus, yeah. And the value. It's the value, right? Anything else we need to be tracking? And so there's some design decisions. Again. Trying to jump around. All right, so there's a number of ways to keep track of this, right? Our coefficients, right? There's going to be, depending on how our indexing is going to go, there's going to be n plus one or n of them. Uh, and so we can keep track of all of them. Right? However, we may run into an instance where you know, a lot of these terms might be, a lot of the coefficients might be zero, or we might have x to the 35. Plus 3x squared plus 2, for example. Right. If you have an instance like this, right, and you certainly want to know that you have uh, a term that's raised to the 35th power, and you want to know that it's coefficient. Okay. And similarly, you want to know that you have a term that's raised to the 8th power, and a coefficient that's 3, right, and so on and so forth. Right, so there's a number of ways you can represent this. You can try to do this, some sort of representing of a sparse list, a uh, list of tuples. Uh, and so very similarly with respect to our matrices, right, there are some design decisions that you make with respect to how to make it as condensed, efficient as possible, right, in hopes of realizing that efficiency in the subsequent operations on the data. So, with respect to your project, what you're going to want to do is come up with a few options to represent your polynomial right, during this design phase. You guys should be in the middle or near the end of your design phase at this at this part. So maybe list out a few different options. What happens if I were to list out the coefficients? Would that say maybe some sort of sparse list representation? Um, what would happen if I implemented it as an array or as some sort of chaining structure? Right. And based on these, write out the pseudocode for some of the operations you would then perform on the and write out the pseudocode for addition, and for multiplication, for evaluation, etc. Right? And just check the time complexity of each option. And if you implement it one way, and what are the time complexity? What are the memory requirements? And try to identify which one might be the best, that it provides for the most efficient overall solution. When measuring the efficiency of each of the algorithms, or each of the operations like addition and perform, subtraction multiplication. So we always have about three cases we have breaking into best case, worst case, and average case. I wouldn't use the best case. It's, you never want to just plan on the best case scenario. It's always good to plan on the worst case or uh, plan on the, the average case. Like the best case doesn't happen very often. So look at the worst case or average case when making your design decision. That is, uh, you, cannot, and you cannot generally, in general, count that the best case doesn't happen very often. If you knew that the best case was going to happen very often, you could incorporate that. Yeah. Um, when we get the input, can we assume that it's ordered correctly so that the highest exponent will be, or that it's always ordered so that the highest ex or the highest exponent value will always be at the bottom of that? No, you should not assume that. The input file may have the, the 
coefficients exponent pair in any order. It may not be increasing or decreasing with respect to exponent. A good question. <coughs> any other any other questions? And I encourage you to spend a good amount of time on the design process. Right, right now you have about a week or so to sort of mull it over. We've gone through a case study where we encountered a number of design uh, decisions and the resulting implications of those decisions. So you should have some intuition as to what sort of pro and con trade-offs you might gain when right, you're making similar design decisions with your polynomial. So I encourage you to sort of just step through the process and some scrap paper, draw out, sketch out the designs, draw out, sketch out some of the pseudocodes for the operations. And Keep track of the time complexity, space complexity of each, and then base your decisions on that. All right, guys, we are out of time here. Enjoy the weekend. See you next week. <coughs> Uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, I just wanted to have that over and stuff. And then the general question. So, as we've been going on, I'm starting to realize I can't imagine it's too before the class started. Like I'm, not, like I'm doing a good job following what we go over in class, but then when it comes to the actual coding part, I'm worried that I'm still rusty on my. Just syntax and, and everything like that, but um, I was curious if you had um, any tutor in mind that could maybe just like get me up to speed. I don't, I'm Help with that uh, programming language yeah. expression of yeah. syntax. Yeah, well, uh, we do have TAs, which can certainly help. I can help a little bit with the syntax. I would encourage you maybe to, if you still have a text from 05152, yeah. I think that's a reasonable. At least multi, so like a good resource you can sort of brush up on. Okay. Pretty well organized textbook. Yeah. Um, a few other textbooks. Yeah. If you still have I, that one. I do have that one, and I'm gonna grab the one for this class right now. But um, yeah, if you have any general questions, you can you can always. I definitely spend a lot of time with TAs and. Like,